Okay, welcome everyone to the first lecture of the semester. Um, this is definitely going to be sort of a uh, review, um, just remind you of a few things that you may have learned but have forgotten about um, because these are going to be some things that we're going to sort of build on um, on this foundation that is given in, in these two chapters and really in the, in the chapters for next week um, as well um, because the purpose of this class is to improve performance. Okay, so um, strength and conditioning typically is the phrase that's used to describe uh, the training of athletes, okay, um, to distinguish from your average fitness client. A fitness client might be interested in getting healthier or um, losing weight, among other things. Where an athlete, typically their main goal is to improve their performance in their sport, okay? Um, so that's really what the, the uh, whole purpose of this class is going to be, is to learn how to assess performance, okay? We're going to probably touch on that minimally. Uh, but then how to train people to become better performers, performers sorry, uh, in whatever that sport might be. Okay, so that's kind of the the goal of the semester in this particular course. Um, so we're going to start out reviewing some of the um, basic ideas from the muscular system. That again, I really just want to use these as sort of a uh, a reminder to you um, because I'm going to be referring to these things throughout many of the lectures this semester. Okay, so the first one is you know, a motor unit, okay? Um, a motor unit can be defined as uh, a single cell, I'm like blanking on the word right now, what is wrong with me? Uh, neuron, oh my gosh, sorry about that everyone. A single neuron, which is a, a cell inside the brain, okay? Uh, and then any single or group of muscle fibers that that neuron innervates or touches, okay? So there are a wide variety of sizes of motor units. Small motor units might only innervate uh, a handful of muscle fibers, okay? Small motor units typically have low force production capacity. Okay? The less muscle fibers are included in the motor unit, the smaller the force production capacity will be. On the other hand, large motor units might innervate thousands, tens of thousands of muscle fibers, okay? Because they can innervate so many more muscle fibers, the force production ability of larger motor units is much, much larger, okay? To give you a couple practical examples, like the muscles in your eye, their chief role is not force production, right? Those muscles are there to carry out very fine, small movements, so the motor units that innervate your eyeball muscles, they're very small, okay? On the other hand, um, the muscles in your hips, your legs, very large muscles, the major role of those muscles is to produce force, to produce movement, so therefore larger motor units are gonna be found in the muscles that surround our hips, okay? And I'll say that muscles are comprised of, of many motor units. It's not like one muscle is one motor unit within a given muscle, there are hundreds of different, thousands of different motor units. Again, it just depends upon uh, the size of the muscle, okay? So that gives us the broad definition of a, of a motor unit. We will come back and touch on that here uh, in just a couple slides once we get to muscle fiber typing. Um, but while we're talking about muscle, let's review what the, the basic functional unit of a, a muscle is. Okay, remember that muscle cells are cylindrical, therefore they are referred to as fibers, okay? Uh, most body cells are circular, muscle fibers are cylindrical, therefore muscle cells are referred to as muscle fibers. Um, we see here, this is an example of a muscle fiber within a given muscle fiber, there are several multiple 
smaller subunits called <clears throat> myofibrils. So here we see an example of a myofibril. Okay? A myofibril then is a band of muscle contractile proteins. Okay, So we kind of continue to break that down within each myofibril we see a series of what we call sarcomeres laid end to end. Okay, So just to give you an example of what a sarcomere is, from this green circle to this green line, this is a single sarcomere. The sarcomere is the basic functional unit of a muscle fiber. Okay, Sarcomeres within a myofibril are laid end to end. So there's one here, then the next one goes here to here, another one would go here to here, and so on. And that is shown in this tiny picture. So this is a myofibril, which is basically a series of sarcomeres laid end to end, okay? When the muscle is innervated and stimulated by the nervous system, by the neuron, by the motor neuron, all of the sarcomeres in a given myofibril will shorten, okay? So imagine this one's gonna shorten, this one's gonna shorten, and when all of these shorten in conjunction, the entire muscle as a whole will shorten, and that brings about uh, the concentric phase of contraction of the muscle. The concentric phase is the shortening phase, okay? Let me just jump back. Um, I was stumbling and sort of like having a little brain fog about the name. I said this is a neuron. We might more accurately refer to this as a motor neuron, okay? Motor neurons control motor function, i.e. movement. Okay, so back to the sarcomere. So within each individual sarcomere, there are a series of overlapping proteins that we call the contractile proteins, okay? The two major ones, as you might remember from exercise science, are uh, myosin, which is the pink. We call this the thick protein. Myosin contains the cross bridges, which look like little tiny golf club heads here, 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 etc. Okay, uh, and then the actin is the thin filament, which is the green. Okay, and these essentially kind of um, overlap one another, right? When they are not bound together, the muscle is in a relaxed state. Uh, when contraction is about to occur, we see the myosin cross bridges bind to the actin molecules. The myosin cross bridges would then contract and pull the actin towards the center of the sarcomere, and that would cause the sarcomere to shorten. And again, if all of the sarcomeres in a myofibril shorten, the muscle as a whole will shorten and contract, okay? Just a few things to point out here. Uh, notice that this is a, um, a three-dimensional situation. So rather than this illustration where it's myosin surrounded by actin just on two sides, it's more like this, right? So the myosin is surrounded by actin three-dimensionally, okay? That's going to allow for more cross bridges to bind to actin, and that's going to enhance force production. The more myosin cross bridges that bind and cycle, the stronger the rate of contraction will be. So in this slide, it just kind of reviews um, the process of, of muscle contraction. Um, ultimately culminating in what is known as the, the sliding filament theory, which I kind of just described to you, um, but I'll, I'll sort of review it again. But I would encourage you maybe to hit pause on the recording, just read the slide on your own. Uh, but basically when there is a, a stimulus initiated in the motor neuron, which is in our brain, so when we think about moving, an impulse is sent down the motor neuron to the muscle fibers. I'm just going to scroll back so we can get a visual of this, right? We think about movement. That signal is propagated down the axon. And at the neuromuscular junction, essentially, um, there is a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which is released, and that causes the muscle fiber to have an electrical impulse generated on the cell membrane. And ultimately, as you probably remember, that causes the release of calcium. Calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it is released from the T tubules. Okay, the calcium then travels into the muscle fiber where it binds to 
troponin, which is here. Troponin then causes tropomyosin to move out of the way. That allows the myosin crossbridge to bind to actin. It has been previously charged by an ATP molecule, and then the contraction occurs. Okay, So to kind of back it up step by step, as long as calcium is present in the myofibril, contraction will continue to occur. We also have to have ATP, right? We need ATP energy, calcium, two things. Okay, As long as calcium is there, contraction will continue to occur. Now, as long as we're thinking about moving, there is an electrical signal coming from our brain that is causing calcium to be released. Okay, But as soon as we make the conscious decision to stop the movement, that electrical impulse is halted. Okay, And in, in absence of that electrical impulse, calcium is no longer being released into the myofibril. The, the calcium that is in there gets pulled out and muscle contraction will stop. To just kind of put it simply. I'm not going to get too much into the details here, but um, again, I would encourage you to pause and, and review this slide, which sort of summarizes what I said um, in a little bit different of a way. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. Uh, and this is a good illustration of what the what an indiv individual sarcomere looks like when it's um, in a relaxed state, which is here. Notice that there is going to be some overlap, which is going to allow for these myosin crossbridge heads to attach to this actin. And then when the whole thing shortens, they're just going to kind of cycle in an, in an asynchronous way to continue to pull that muscle fiber. So this would essentially represent sort of three stages. So relaxed, there is some contraction occurring here. Um, we're kind of getting to the point where the muscle will not be able to shorten any further, but at the bottom we see what a maximal completely contracted muscle looks like. And notice that we are at a maximal level of shortening, so the muscle will not be able to shorten any further because basically the myosin proteins have now hit the end of what we call the Z line. Okay, When we're in these two conditions, the muscle can still shorten to a certain extent, but down here we have achieved sort of a full shortening and there is no further shortening uh, that can occur. Okay. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, these are a couple of the key points. Um, the more myosin that is bound to actin, the greater the amount of force production that can occur. Okay, um, So it is advantageous, again, for that sort of uh, three-dimensional way that the muscle fibers are laid out. It allows for maximal cross-bridge binding. But also consider um, that the larger a muscle is, the greater amount of actin and myosin it will have which would therefore result in higher force production. So the advantage of having large muscles is that you have more contractile proteins. The more contractile proteins that you have that can bind and contract, that's going to increase the amount of force that a muscle can produce and in plainer terms would make somebody stronger. Okay. <clears throat> Second key point, I also mentioned two things that are necessary for contraction to occur. We need that calcium. <clears throat> calcium will be present as long as you're consciously thinking about movement. We also then need ATP to facilitate the, the binding and contraction and the relaxation. Okay, Contraction requires an ATP. Relaxation also requires an ATP. Okay, So as long as ATP is available, contraction can, can, can continue to occur. Now, when we're, when we're exercising at a very high intensity, ATP starts to not be available, uh, which is why we experience muscle fatigue, right? Um, if I'm holding a weight sort of doing a bench press and I start to lower the, the bar and I just sort of hold it in this position, right? Eventually, ATP is going to no longer be available to allow me to hold this muscle contraction. And that's at one point I'm going to start to lose the ability to produce enough force to overcome that resistance okay and that occurs you know if you're sprinting doing basic resistance training whatever it is um, if you're at a higher intensity eventually your ability to sustain that force production becomes 
impacted because ATP is no longer available for a variety of reasons that we will have touched on in other classes, but we'll touch on, on them again as we move down the road a little bit further. Well, let's carry on. Um, speaking of force production, okay? And back to motor units, okay? Um, now, when a motor unit is activated, every muscle fiber in that motor unit contracts, okay? And that's what we call the all or none principle. It's not like if we had a motor unit that had, say, five fibers in it, that two would contract and three would not. It's all or nothing. So either all five do or all five don't, okay? Now, the way that we scale force production then is by not activating all motor units at the same time, right? We tend to, as we'll see, according to what's known as the size principle, we always activate the smaller motor units first, okay? If those motor units allow us to produce enough force to accomplish the task, then we will not recruit any more. However, if those small motor units do not allow us to accomplish the task, we will progressively recruit larger motor units until the point where if we are trying to recruit, sorry, if we are trying to produce maximal levels of force, we will be recruiting all of our motor units, okay? Now in life, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, and because of that reason, neurologically, most of us don't even know how to activate all of our motor units. But strength training, uh, particularly lifting heavy loads, sort of trains your brain to be better able to activate motor units and produce maximal amounts of force, right? Um, it's kind of like riding a bike. When you first try to ride a bike, your nervous system doesn't know how to activate muscles in the proper sequence to keep you not only on the bike, but pedaling in a coordinated fashion. But the more you practice riding that bike, your brain learns the motor unit recruitment pattern that allows you to cycle. Same idea for lifting weights. When you're first trying to do a maximal lift, your brain doesn't know how to properly recruit the motor units um, in a coordinated fashion to allow for that max force production. But the more you practice it, your nervous system, your brain is going to learn how to activate the motor units in the proper sequence to allow for maximal force production. Now, kind of jumping back to the motor units, um, motor unit types sort of parallel the muscle fiber types. You probably remember the muscle fiber types from exercise science, okay? In humans, we have sort of three broad types. There's actually more than three, but they, they kind of neatly fit into these three categories here, okay? And our motor units actually also fall into the same categories, okay? So your type one motor units are small motor units, and they're usually composed of type one muscle fibers, okay? Because the force production needs of type one muscle fibers are low, you see some characteristics. So the motor neuron is smaller, okay? Smaller, oops, oops, wrong way. Smaller motor neurons conduct the signal slower, so force production is less. Okay, that's echoed again here, slower nerve conduction uh, velocity, okay? Because type 1 muscle fibers, they are slower contracting, they are more of an endurance-based muscle fiber, so you don't need to have high rates of activation. Now on the flip side, the opposite, if we go over here, your type 2X muscle fibers are responsible for high levels of force production, okay? So they're going to require rapid activation. Therefore, the motor neuron in type 2 fibers is large, okay? The larger, think of it like a water hose, right? If you have a very small water hose, water is going to flow more slowly through it, but if you have a giant water hose, the water is going to flow a lot faster. So the volume of water is going to be larger because the water hose is larger. Same idea with the neuron size. The larger the neuron, the faster that signal can travel down, and that's going to allow for a more rapid rate of force production, okay? So larger neuron size, faster conduction velocity, that's gonna to lead to faster contraction speed, faster relaxation speed. The price we pay for that rapid speed of conduction and high force production is low fatigue resistance, right? Low endurance, okay? But the force production is high. You kinda, of, there's a trade-off. If your force production capabilities are high, your fatigue resistance is low and vice versa, okay? 
So just in case, just to clear up any confusion, um, this chart is specifically talking about muscle fiber types, but motor units also go by the same names of type one motor unit, type two A motor unit, type two X motor unit. Typically a motor unit is made up of the same fiber type, okay? Although there is some mixing, but the majority of the fibers in a type two X motor unit are gonna be type two X fibers. So as I mentioned, uh, the motor unit recruitment pattern will follow what we call uh, the size principle, where your, your smaller type one motor units are always gonna be recruited first, okay? If the force production needs cannot be met by their smaller motor units, then we will progressively recruit the moderate and then the larger type two motor units, okay? So the critical thinking opportunity, and this is their first critical thinking assignment, will ask you to sort of restate this in your own words. Um, but this protocol that you see in the chart here is known as the Bruce Treadmill Protocol. This is a treadmill test that is used to um, measure VO2 max, but also to, to help detect if somebody has heart disease, okay? And this is what we call a graded exercise test where the person starts off at a low intensity and then um, the stages in this protocol are three minutes long. As we progress to the next stage, the intensity gets prog progressively harder, okay? So in the first stage, it is a very easy, slow walk at a low incline, which would then require low force production, right? So therefore, we can utilize our smaller motor units because the force production needs in the initial stages of the Bruce Pred treadmill protocol are low, okay? Once we get up to um, the third stage, now we're walking a little bit faster. Uh, the incline is a little bit more steep. We're gonna need to produce more force to be able to stay on that treadmill. Therefore, we're gonna recruit sort of our next set of motor units, which are a little bit larger than the initial ones that we used early in the test, okay? As we then continue to progress through this test and we get to the last couple stages, you're gonna be walking pretty fast, okay? 4.2 miles per hour, which is kind of like the top speed a human can walk comfortably, while also being on a very severe um, treadmill grade. Now, in my mind, I think I have the number, I think it's a 17% grade. I might be off a little bit on that, but that's a very high incline at a very fast walking speed. Um, so you're, you're gonna need to produce a lot of force to stay on that treadmill. Therefore, you're now gonna need to recruit sort of all of your muscle motor units and, and therefore muscle fibers will, will be activated and contributing because your force production needs are so much higher, okay? Um, I hope that makes sense and that you can sort of restate that in the critical thinking assignment, okay? But again, just to recap it, Force production needs are low early in the test, so we can use our small motor units as the force production needs increase as we move through the test. Ultimately, we're gonna need our larger motor units to produce force as the force production needs of the activity increase as we proceed through the test. And here, again, uh, the size principle is restated. And this, this is a pretty decent graphic, right? Force production capabilities, if the force production needs, I'm sorry, are low, you're gonna be recruiting the smaller motor units. But as force production needs increase, you're gonna need to not only use the small motor units, but you're gonna have to also start recruiting your larger motor units because those of that increased need for uh, force production. All right, so we're going to sort of transition to another topic um, that, again, I know when I taught exercise science last semester, we, we touched on this, so it shouldn't be new to any of you. Um, but proprioception is something that's really required in strength and conditioning. Um, what that really, the meaning of proprioception is, it's sort of the awareness of where your body is in space, right? When you're moving your limbs in a dynamic fashion, we have to know... Um, our nervous system has to know 
sort of what the muscle length is at, at any given time. Okay, it also has to make adjustments. And then we also need to know how much tension is being developed in a muscle at any, any given time. Those things will not only assist in force production, but they will also help us to prevent injury, which is, is very important uh, during athletics, okay? So there's really two primary ways that we um, carry out this proprioception. Uh, and the first one is using an organelle known as a muscle spindle. Okay? Now the muscle spindle is a specialized organelle that is gonna monitor the length of a given muscle, okay? Um, basically, in this, in this diagram, we see that in a muscle, there are the, the muscle fibers, okay, that sort of go in parallel. Um, but lying within those muscle fibers, there are these specialized muscle fibers that are known as intrafusal fibers. It is within the intrafusal fibers where the muscle spindle lies, okay? Now, the extrafusal fibers, that's what we call the normal muscle fibers, they produce force, okay? They change in length, they lengthen. Sorry, they shorten, they lengthen. The intrafusal fibers, they also shorten and lengthen, but they do not produce force, okay? They basically adjust their length based upon the length of the extrafusal fibers, okay? Um, and they do this as a way of providing feedback to the nervous system, so the nervous system will be aware of the position of a muscle, the length of a muscle, at any given time, okay? So basically, as the muscles, the extrafusal fibers shorten or lengthen, that information is sent to the uh, nervous system. And this is actually mediated at the level of the spinal cord. So it's a reflex. It's not something that we're uh, consciously aware of. Feedback is then provided then back to the extrafusal fibers. So there's this constant monitoring that's going on, okay? Um, that when a muscle is rapidly stretched, force production is automatically upregulated in that muscle. You have probably seen this happen. Um, if you've ever gone to the doctor for a checkup and the doctor has taken a little hammer uh, and he has hit your patella tendon right below your knee and your, your leg contracts, your quadricep contracts, right? That's an example of this in practice, right? When the doctor hits the patella tendon with the little hammer, the muscle fibers in the quadricep are quickly lengthened, okay? That information is then sent to the spinal cord and then a response is reflexively and immediately sent back down to you, which causes the contraction of that muscle, which is why your foot kicks out, okay? That is an example of proprioception using the muscle spindle. Now that's advantageous for um, lifting weights because whenever we rapidly lengthen a muscle, the reflexive force production is always higher in the concentric phase. Okay, so that's why, you know, and most human movements actually always involve a lengthening prior to a shortening. Okay. So this one actually helps us produce force. Now the other proprioceptive mechanism is known as the Golgi tendon organ. And this one actually can inhibit force production because its primary role is to monitor tension in a muscle, okay? Specifically, it wants to limit tension in order to prevent injury to the tendon, right? Think about um, somebody who is not well-trained their connective tissues are not going to be that strong just because they haven't been placed under stress. Okay, so theoretically, if a lot of tension developed in a muscle that is not trained, the connective tissue being weak, that connective tissue, the tendon could be damaged. It could um, develop a slight tear or it could rupture altogether. Both bad situations. Okay, so what the Golgi tendon organ does, and it's, it's located um, in the tendon, when it detects tension, that information is again sent, sorry, to the spinal cord, and there is an inhibitory signal then sent back to that muscle causing relaxation, okay? Now, this is something that is strong in untrained people, and it, it is thought that that is what keeps untrained people from actually um, producing force kind of matching the muscle mass that they have, okay? 
but through training by participating in consistent resistance training, as your, which will cause your connective tissues to get stronger, okay, because they're being placed under stress. The activity of the Golgi tendon organ is lessened, okay, so it's not as sensitive and would therefore not send this inhibitory signal, which would then come back and reduce force production, okay. So through training, that's what we call an, a neural adaptation. We'll talk about that later on in the semester. Neural inhibition is reduced, which allows you to produce more force in a given muscle. So it's almost like you can get stronger without putting on muscle mass because your nervous system is better able to express force using the muscle that you have. Inhibition of the Golgi tendon, tendon organ is a major way that that happens. But in an untrained person, the Golgi tendon organ reacts much more strongly. Okay, moving on. So, what is the point of all this that we just talked about, right? Um, the point of strength and conditioning in general is to take scientific principles, such as the things that we just talked about, um, and figure out how to utilize those to allow an athlete to perform better, okay? Specifically, athletes are typically going to be better able to perform in their sport if they can produce more force. Okay, so what we identify on this slide are three, the three primary ways that athletes can be taught or trained to produce more force. Okay, the first one is to optimize neural recruitment. That's kind of what I just outlined a second ago, that an untrained person, we almost have like this, um, almost like a seatbelt in a way that our, our brain kind of puts on us to keep us safe but it holds us back. Through training though, we can take that seatbelt off and the nervous system is then allowed to fully activate muscles to then produce force, okay? So there's a neural adaptation that occurs and that's actually the first phase of adaptation to strength training is this neural adaptation where your brain is taught in um, how to recruit muscles in a coordinated fashion. And we also see the removal of that inhibition brought on by the Golgi tendon organ, okay? That's one way. The second way we, have to, we talked about already as well is, you know, if you have more contractile protein, force production will increase. Well, how do we gain more contractile protein? By growing the muscle larger, okay? So by adding muscle mass through specific types of training, we can increase the amount of protein found in the muscle, and that will then allow for force production to go up, okay? Uh, then thirdly, we have to really train our fast twitch muscle fibers how to be the most efficiently used, okay? So there are different ways of doing that. Um, but to kind of put it simply, if you want to be fast, you have to train fast, okay? You can be really strong, but if you always move weight very slowly, you're not gonna be fast on the athletic field, okay? So you have to train in a way that's gonna make you faster, right? So you have to train fast to be fast. Close that door now. Sorry about that, three kids. Um, so that's, that's something that we're gonna learn about, you know, and there's a lot of ways to do that. Doing plyometrics, um, sprint training, Olympic lifting, you know, a lot of different ways that strength conditioning coaches would use to, as we see here, optimize fast twitch muscle recruitment, which is going to make the athlete faster and more powerful, right? Power is the ability to exert force with speed, okay? So we'll come back and talk about that term down the road for sure. All right, we're going to switch gears and roll through a little bit of biomechanics quickly. Um, I'm going to keep this short and sweet, but just, you know, consider that the point of muscles, skeletal muscles, is to produce movement, okay? Um, a few terms just to throw out here, an agonist is the muscle that is bringing about the movement, okay? So, for example, um, if I wanted to curl something, my bicep is going to be the agonist because it's the muscle that is promoting the movement of my arm in that direction. Okay. Now on the opposite, we have the antagonist. The antagonist is kind of the muscle that's going to go against the agonist. Okay. So an example I just used 
the bicep is the agonist, so the tricep is going to be the antagonist, okay? One key way we adapt to strength training is we, and this is one of those neural adaptations, we want to fully express the agonist and minimize the contribution of the antagonist. Now, one way the Golgi tendon organ in inhibits the agonist is by activating the antagonist, okay? So part of that neural adaptation, part of that um, reduction in Golgi tendon organ activity allows us to minimize the activity of the antagonist because the antagonist is going to fight against force production and we don't want that to occur, right? Okay. Then lastly, the other term we want to mention are the synergists. The synergists are muscles that would assist but not directly cause the movement, right? So when I'm curling something, the muscles in my forearm are going to be synergists. They're going to assist in the movement, but they're not going to be directly promoting the movement, okay? Again, learning how to adequately stimulate your synergists can increase force production um, as well, okay? So we say all this to kind of jump into some of the basics of, of biomechanics, okay? Biomechanics is basically the study of the mechanisms that create movement, okay? And key to all of this is going to be the understanding, the basic understanding of what are called uh, levers, okay? All of the muscles, bones, and joints in our body, they're going to utilize some type of lever to produce movement, okay? Um, not all muscles, as it says here, act through levers, um, but most of them do, okay? Um, most body movements directly involved in sports and exercises are going to act through using the skeleton and the muscles and the tendons as they attach to the bones to produce some sort of lever, and that lever is going to really increase what we're going to see in a second, which is known as the mechanical advantage to allow us to produce force. Okay, so let's take a look at, uh, well, let's actually first, we're going to talk about the mechanical um, advantage, okay? <clears throat> Muscles with the greater mechanical advantage require less force, okay, which means, um, and think about what a mechanical advantage might be, right? If I had to, um, let me think about this for a second. If I had to move like a washing machine or something heavy, like a heavy appliance, right? I could get under it and pick it up, right? But my mechanical advantage is poor because I'm so close to the machine, okay? But if I was able to get like a two by four, stick it under, here's my washer and dryer, let's use this cup actually stick it under, and then I was able to get like um, a giant rock or something and put it under my hand, I could then use the lever to create a mechanical advantage to move, lift up that washer, clothes washer, much easier, okay? That would give me a greater mechanical advantage versus if I was just under it trying to lift it on my own, okay? So the kind of the, the purpose of our skeleton is to allow for us to gain a mechanical advantage in some way so we can produce more force really with less effort, okay? It's all about um, efficiency. Having a higher mechanical advantage increases efficiency, means you're gonna use less ATP, you're also gonna be at a, um, a lower risk of, of injury, okay? Now, unfortunately for us, a lot of skeletal muscles will operate in, at a mechanical disadvantage, okay? Um, but that's why training is important to sort of minimize the effect of the mechanical disadvantage by training these three mechanisms that we saw on this slide, right? To allow us to overcome that disadvantage. So now let's take a look at the lever classes. There are three primary ones. Uh, the first one is um, what we call the first class lever, okay? So with this one, we have, we're always gonna have a fulcrum. So on this one, the fulcrum is between the muscular force and the assistive force, okay? Think about this as the example I use with the bicep curl. The fulcrum um, is the elbow, oops, sorry. You have your muscular force on one side of the fulcrum 
and you then have your resistive force on the other side. So imagine like this is the, the resistance you're trying to overcome or the load that you're trying to move, okay? And you're using the fulcrum here. Now what we'll talk about here in a second is there are, the advantage is going to change based upon where you are in the range of motion. There are going to be certain points where we might have a mechanical advantage and then certain points where there's a mechanical disadvantage, right? If you think about a bicep curl, the ease with which you produce that movement is going to change throughout the range of motion. You're at a mechanical disadvantage when your arm is fully extended, right? But once you get to 90 degrees and then beyond, the mechanical advantage is going to increase and it becomes easier to move that load, okay? So we're going to keep that in mind is that there are going to be certain parts of the range of motion where there's a disadvantage and then where there's an advantage. It's going to change based upon where you are uh, in the range of motion, okay? So for a first class lever, again, like a basic bicep curl is an example. Um, a knee extension machine would be another good, or a, a, a a hamstring curl on the machine, that's another good example of that, where the fulcrum's in the middle, your mechanical force is on one side, which is the muscle, the resistive force on, is on the other side, which is where the load is you're trying to move. Now, a second class lever is different, okay? Here, both the mechanical force and the resistive force are on the same side of the fulcrum, right? So our fulcrum is going to be here at what we see is the ball of the foot, okay? My apologies if you hear the screaming baby. That was a uh, not a scheduled guest for this lecture, but it happens. Uh, now the advantage of the second class lever is because both the mechanical force and the resistive force are on the same side of the fulcrum, there is gonna be less force required or less muscle action required to overcome that force okay so the, the picture kind of shows us the best example in the body and that's going to be you know, your calf muscle right uh, we can produce a lot of force with our calf muscles which is good because that's how we jump um, because of the way that the lever uh, is set up okay um, being on the same side of the fulcrum as where the resistance is which is going to be your you know your body weight pushing down on the fulcrum, which is the ball of your foot, okay? But the mechanical force is on that same side where your muscle is. So when that muscle contracts, less forces, less mechanical action is required to overcome that force, which is your body mass, okay? Lastly, then, we have the, uh, the third class lever. Now, when you look at the third class lever, it's going to look very similar to the first class in terms of the, the anatomical picture uh, that it's showing us. Okay. And what is going on here is what this picture is showing is sort of pushing away, which is going to be the tricep extension. Okay. So I, I kind of misspoke a second ago when I identified this as the bicep. This is more the tricep is going to attach opposite where the resistance is. So for a pushing away, that's a first class lever, okay? The difference then with the third class, if you notice, now we're looking at the bicep specifically, which is gonna attach to the bone on the same side of the fulcrum as where force is being produced, okay? So for pulling, which is a bicep curl, we're looking at a third class lever. For pushing, which is moving away, that is going to be the, the first class lever. Now, think about that for a second. Um, which one of those intuitively do you think you will be able to produce more force with? Pulling typically is going to give you higher levels of force production, okay? Uh, because again, you ever heard of a uh, higher mechanical advantage. The attachment where the force, the muscular action is being produced is closer to the resistance, where over here, it's gonna be further away, right? So the, mo the, uh, the mechanical advantage is lessened, so greater muscular activity is gonna be required with the first class lever, 
compared to the third class level. <clears throat> So another example of the mechanical advantage is looking at the, the knee, uh, specifically with the patella tendon. Okay, So the kneecap, really what the kneecap allows us to do is it kind of pushes the patella tendon away from the bone slightly. So this picture here shows us what a, what a knee would look like without the patella, no kneecap, versus here. And you'll notice the angle is a little bit steeper here versus here. So because that angle is steeper, that is going to actually increase the mechanical advantage uh, in this particular jump, um, joint and muscle complex. Okay? And that's why you're able to produce, you know, one of the reasons why you can produce more force with your quadricep than you can with the tricep because of this way the, jo the, the joint is designed to give you a, a greater mechanical advantage okay there's obviously other reasons why we have the kneecap um, but that is one of the benefits of of having the patella so here we're kind of just jumping back to that mechanical advantage discussion and really it's just showing that as the distance changes um, as we move through the different ranges of motion as i sort of talked about earlier the mechanical advantage is going to change and that's why we have these things um, you may have heard of called sticking points uh, a sticking point is usually sort of the the point in the range of motion where you have to produce the most force the most you have to produce the most force to overcome the resistance with the bicep curl usually that is going to be sort of in this zone here okay and that's because sorry the distance is greatest um, at that point, okay? Which then takes your mechanical advantage away. Um, all right, so let's finish this up. We're at 46 minutes, and that's about the length of time I like to keep uh, the lectures. Uh, the tendon insertion is obviously where force is gonna be transmitted. Muscular force is transmitted to the bone through the tendon, right? So we talked earlier about how when your tendons when you're untrained, your tendons are weaker, more likely to be injured, but strength training increases the strength of that tendon to allow for greater amounts of force to be transmitted to that bone and for you know more powerful movements uh, to be performed. Okay. Here we're kind of just talking about, again, the factors that are related to performance and human strength. We've already talked about the neural control we will get more into this in later lectures, but just take a moment to read these last couple. We already talked about how the actual size or cross-sectional area of a muscle will also influence its ability to produce force. A couple things that we didn't mention, though, we see on this slide, um, the way that muscle fibers are arranged, okay? So there are different arrangements for muscle fibers, okay? Uh, we're not going to go through them all right now because it doesn't really matter for our discussion. But just note that, that certain muscles, um, they're able to produce more force than others because of the way that the fibers are arranged within the muscle. Okay, um, One example of that is uh, the pinnate, a pinnate muscle, which sort of allows the muscle fibers to be at an angle to the tendon. So that when they shorten, there is a greater amount of force that is transmitted through that tendon to the bone, which makes for a more forceful contraction and, and movement there. Okay? We can skip the muscle fiber length because that does not play a huge role. However, I will say a lot of research does now point to the fact that uh, aggressive static stretching prior to strength training can actually reduce force production, which would then have a negative impact on adaptation. Um, because we want to have that optimal overlap with our actin and myosin. Okay? If we stretch ourselves aggressively pre-training, maybe we pull those apart a little bit more. Now we don't have as much actin and myosin overlap, so our force production ability can be compromised versus if we're at more of an optimal resting muscle length where we have good overlap, now we have a good amount of bite that can be uh, achieved by our actin and myosin 
and that can allow for greater force production. Okay, so there is an optimal muscle fiber length, which does now bring the recommendation of not doing aggressive static stretching prior to uh, intense training. Muscular actions, um, hopefully you all are familiar with this. Um, concentric, concentric phase is the shortening phase. Eccentric phase is the lengthening phase. And then the isometric phase would be where there is no change in muscle length. Um, most movements, obviously, are going to have concentric and eccentric, not necessarily isometric phases. Although at certain point in time, there might be a short isometric phase that exists between transitions from shortening to lengthening. Uh, but just be familiar with those terms, because we'll use those terms um, quite a bit. Concentric is shortening, the shortening phase. Eccentric is the lengthening phase. We'll come back and talk a little bit about this, um, but just to mention it now, because of this mechanical disadvantage that can exist and sort of change through the ranges of motion of certain exercises, we do always want to be mindful of preventing injury, okay? One way that we can do that for our spine in order to prevent back injury, which is always a concern, like lower backs are particularly vulnerable, especially when you're doing exercises like back squats, deadlifts, um, Olympic lifts, etc. You always want to be mindful of helping to stabilize that lumbar spine, okay? Lifting belts can certainly do that, but that's almost like having a crutch. We don't want to rely on that. When we have the ability ourselves to almost produce like an intrinsic lifting belt, using intra-abdominal pressure, um, usually using what is known as uh, the fluid ball, okay? So we can do that by essentially performing what is known as the, the Valsalva maneuver, which you see um, here. So what we would want to do is when we're moving into this point of mechanical disadvantage, as we would be doing when we're descending into a squat, we want to make sure that we're stabilizing our lumbar spine the best that we can. We can use the fluid and the air that is in our lungs to create sort of a stable column. And we do that by, we, what I always say is you exhale against the closed glottis, right? And that's indicated right here. It's like you close your mouth, but you blow out at the same time. And when you do that, I can't talk because I'm doing that right now. You create some tension in your abdominal area. And that tension actually can help in stabilizing the lumbar spine, right? So this is something that you always want to teach novice athletes who are new to resistance training exercises, um, how to perform this maneuver almost so it becomes a uh, second nature when we are doing more advanced lifts where there's an increased risk of injury. If they sort of intrinsically perform this maneuver, you can avoid injury. Okay. So um, that's going to wrap it up for this week. Again, that was kind of a brief review of muscular system, some biomechanical talk. All of this will come into play. You know, we'll kind of be talking about um, we'll layer on top of this in the coming weeks as we really get into the practical application of the science, right? You've, you've learned the science. Now we want to learn how to apply that science to, in this case, improve human performance uh, in a given sport or activity. Uh, so I will come back and talk to you all next week. Take care.